the first of three virtual brown bag uh, lectures uh, on natural language processing and artificial intelligence sponsored by the Mesa department. Um, despite what it says at the bottom of my screen, I'm Henry Brown. I'm a professor in the Mesa department. And it's my pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker for today, Matthias von der Veer. Let me just say, um, by way of introduction, NLP, natural language processing, is perhaps the best, one of the best, or at least until recently, was one of the best known and most widely uh, used um, strategies within the AI world and goes back quite a ways, as far as I know, back as far as 19. 67, when Alice Page began to do automated scoring of essays. And of course, we've come quite a long way from there. Um, we've come quite a long way. Um, and I think the real impetus came from my point of view in, in the area of large scale assessments, particularly high stakes assessments like uh, the GRE, which in the 19, early 1990s moved from paper and pencil to computer. And once people started writing uh, word processing essays on the computer, it seemed pretty obvious that we needed to develop uh, algorithms to score those essays rather than to have human beings continue to, uh, to provide the, uh, the scores. And from those modest beginnings back in the early 90s, we now have a quite a sophisticated set of uh, different strategies for scoring uh, essays about short answer questions and longer essays and providing uh, with the capability i would say of providing uh, very useful feedback to the writers unfortunately um, at least as far as i know the applications of this technology are mostly residing within the context of large-scale assessments both the low stakes and the high stakes and much less so in the context of instructional assessment and i regard that as a as a, a very sad, <laughs> a sad commentary on where we are. Of course, uh, AI now is much broader than NLP, um, and we have all sorts of techniques for uh, analyzing or uh, revealing patterns in large data sets and using the those revealed patterns to make inferences about the real world or to create uh, prediction algorithms for other purposes. And I can think of no one in this university who is better equipped to give us an introduction than Matthias van der Veer, who is the Monon Professor of Education in the Lynch School. He's also the Executive Director of the International Study Center, Executive Editor of Psychometrica, and he actually wears a few other hats. Um, and so he's obviously a very busy guy, and uh, we're very much appreciative of the fact that he's taking an hour out of uh, a very crowded day to uh, give us some insights on NLP and AI. So without further ado, uh, Matthias, I turn the Zoom floor over to you. Yeah, thank you, Henry, for this nice introduction. And thank you, everybody, for coming virtually to this session. Uh, I'm going to join, uh, chair first the um, little flyer that you might have seen just to uh, say that there are two more speakers that will produce uh, really wonderful presentations for you. Um, the next speaker is Victoria Janeva from NBME, that's the National Board of Medical Examiners. And then the third speaker will be Karen Arnold uh, in November, then we will take a break. And then we will actually go further the next year and have also speakers uh, from uh, our department, as well as external speakers, who will continue the series. So uh, stay tuned. And I will stop sharing and go to the presentation. Um, so I came into this field of um, AI, natural language processing. I have to see how I can actually. Can you all see the presentation? Yes. Okay, yes. Good. Um, just have to see. Okay, I can even navigate. I came into this field kind of uh, by uh, yeah an accident uh, that we had with a large scale assessment, an international assessment, where we had 
an item type that we tried to score automatically but couldn't because people were making careless errors. And um, I've been doing stuff ever since, more or less since 2012, 2011, even before that. Early on, um, when I was still teaching back in Germany, I did a little bit of teaching on neural networks, but then there came AI winter and nobody did anything with AI and neural networks, so nothing really happened. And then again, essentially finding my way to well, really more AI than NLP. And um, uh, in, in yeah, the last few years, the NLP part also has an interesting development because NLP kind of morphed into yet another field that uses a lot of AI. There's still more traditional NLP with uh, feature engineering and, and uh, methods that we won't talk too much about today. But then there's also a lot of uh, NLP applications that actually are using especially large neural networks. I'm going to talk about those today. I will only give examples. I won't give a full overview of everything uh, because first of all, I don't know everything. And second, I uh, will focus on the applications that matter most to um, our domain here. Um, so why do we do this? One charge that we have, uh, Henry mentioned that I'm also working for uh, yeah, Tims and Pearls and, and trying to advance these assessments is to keep them up and running and improving them every cycle. Um, so I talk a little bit about that. Uh, I would talk about automated scoring, something that Henry also mentioned in the introduction, what AI is already doing very well. Um, and I'm going to talk about automated item generation quite extensively, and I will end with something that is more or less a proposal, uh, what we might want to do next. Um, so that has been quite a development. So I will actually spend a lot of time not, I, I will spend some time on automated scoring, but most of the time more on uh, automated item generation. and. Um, there are a couple of people who also work with me at the International Study Center here. Um, many of them also contributed to different pieces of work here. Some of that is not yet published. Um, I will also so show some papers that are in, either in press or submitted or already published um, so that you can see what we are up to these days. Um, TIMS is the Trends in Mathematics and Science Study. Uh, this takes place every four years since 1995. In 2019, it was halfway digital, so about half the countries. In 2023, it would be fully digital with a few exceptions. So everything will be delivered on the computer and a lot of stuff will also be stored automatically, hence the motivation already. Uh, it's pretty much the longest trend line in mathematics and science achievement. Um, it's assessing fourth and eighth grade students around the world. Uh, PEARLS is progress in the in international reading literacy study, happened since 2001, every five years. Again, we have a longer transition into the digital world, but by 2026, we should be fully digital. It might seem slow to some because many other testing programs are already fully digital, uh, but the reason is that many countries are not prepared or don't prefer not to move to digital assessment and are a little bit reluctant so that they really essentially try to wait for the early adopters so whether it would work but i think we by now have pretty much uh, uh, good support that this actually works well even though it's a lot of work of course pearls assesses fourth grade um, and both of them contain a lot of innovations that, that are essentially trying to push the envelope and, and trying to improve what's being done every time, uh, every four years versus five years, respectively. Um, TIMS 23 includes something that we called country level adaptive design. It's more or less a targeted assessment design that uh, takes care of uh, the fact that countries with a wide variety of achievement distributions are participating. There are interactive items there. There's com 
Computer delivery in 23, of course, I mentioned that. It should be 100%, it will be 95 plus. Very few will insist on still taking the older paper version, but um, for a variety of reasons, so there might be four countries left that do that. Uh, what's important for us here today, this will be automatically scored as far as we can push it. Uh, we can try for most items. We won't be successful for all the items. We will have some human scoring. But for example, in math fourth grade, we have very few items left that cannot be automatically scored. But that's a variety of items. Some are very simple, so you wouldn't call that AI or anything what you're doing there. It's more pattern matching. Um, of course, we also do a lot of work in process data indicators. And um, one of the fun projects that we've been working on is uh, automated scoring for free drawing tool responses. So students draw something and we're using artificial neural networks to score them automatically. Um, PERLS again is also an adaptive, uh, adaptive design. Uh, there's electronic reading, ePERLs, and digital, as well as paper PERLs there. In 2021 and 26, there won't be paper PERLs. That's at least the goal. Again, automated scoring is envisioned, but um, whether we get there, of course, it's a matter of doing the right research and, and being successful. And then, of course, we would also like to uh, based on process data and, and all kinds of other data that we can collect uh, also look into whether we can do uh, better in terms of assessment design and try to reduce non-response so there are a lot of things that we are trying to do but in order to do that we should be able to score things that we observe automatically because otherwise we can't adjust and, and adapt uh, to what's going on uh, so let me jump now into um, the automated scoring parts. We have um, a team that is working on technologies such as deep learning for automated scoring and open-ended responses. And that has pretty much three goals. The first one is really to support the human scoring in terms of giving quality measures. We cannot score everything twice, which would be ideal, so that we could directly look at scorer agreement across all the open-ended responses. That's simply too expensive. Scoring is also a big, I shouldn't say a big mess, so we have to edit that out in the recording. It's a very complex endeavor. Um, scoring has to be done in whatever, 70 plus countries in almost 100 languages. So you have to train scorers. The scorers have to either translate the scoring into their language and train the scoring trainers, I should say, train the scorers then. Maybe part of them is also scoring themselves, but usually they have a bigger team. So you essentially train people who then train people and then do the scoring. You have very little handle on uh, adjusting the scoring, monitoring what's going on while you're doing it. So automated scoring would give you additional input and additional data to monitor the scoring quality process as well. And then, of course, the goal is also to not only support human scoring, but maybe replace it with automated scoring and uh, of both graphical and written responses. And why would we do that? One reason is that while computers don't get tired, uh, computers don't have score uh, uh, biases like leniency or severity uh, scorers or automated scoring engines if they misunderstand we know because they don't have high scoring agreement with say target scores or expert generated scores we can't do that kind of monitoring and adjusting as easily with human scorers we essentially have to trust that it will work after we trained them we can look into a subset of items in terms of agreement with the second scorer, but that's about it. So automated scoring has a lot of advantages from that perspective. Um, I think I just told you about this slide. Uh, so essentially, we can indeed better monitor AI scoring. And we also, one advantage that came to my mind, when you, when you train on old data and you have a trend item 
say, data points from four years ago, what you're doing is essentially mimicking how the scoring was done four years ago when still the humans were scoring all the responses. So that actually means not only have you created an engine that is highly reliable, but also one that exactly functions like the scorers four years ago functioned. So you actually have better trend data on the scoring instead of training people four years from today who might have no background in scoring or um, wouldn't have uh, all the materials that the people four years ago had or might have had some other background. Um, so there are advantages to keep things consistent by using automated scoring. Um, one example that I want to show here is this, um, I think, really interesting task where students have to build something virtually. So they are confronted with a problem. You get a building, a shed, and they're supposed to say, OK, how do you cut out from a piece of wood something that would fit a back wall, a side wall, a roof, or whatever? Yeah. And they get a drawing tool, so they can scroll to this drawing tool here. And then what they get is essentially a few tools. They can draw, they can erase, they can start over. And then they can say, okay, I'm done. I made my back wall, uh, I made my side walls, and this is the solution I would like to submit. That gives us an image, a JPEG, a PNG image that is stored in the computer with what the student has done. It might also give us a process, so how they actually drew, whether they erased, but let's just say, okay, we, we are keeping it simple. We just look at the final product, what they've done, and we check whether it was more or less correct. And then these are example responses um, that um, we've seen in the, um, in the data. And you see some students get really creative. Some kind of get it right, but not quite understand that they shouldn't have cut those into pieces here. So the triangle plus the square doesn't really make this shape because you have to fix it somehow together. And these three squares don't, yeah, again, have would have to be connected in order to make the back wall. Um, so not quite right. Then you have correct responses that vary quite a bit because there's not ju just one, there's rotations, there's uh, do those sides actually coincide or are those separate sides that have to be cut separately or did they try to save cutting time? Um, so a human can do that hopefully quite reliably, but it's also a lot of work. So you have to look at every response and decide is it actually correct. So we tried and we used artificial neural networks. So one of the first applications, uh, Frank Rosenblatt here is um, famous for that, uh, was detecting or recognizing digits. Um, so pattern recognition or image recognition is more or less the bread and butter of artificial neural networks. Those are simulating primitive kind of, uh, in primitive ways, kind of uh, what's going on in simple brains, maybe no more complex brains these days because we really get very big models these days that are quite powerful. And some of the standard applications is recognizing categories, so computer vision, uh, self-driving cars, um, even representing meaning. So computer-based neural networks can extract essentially verbal con uh, text descriptions from images. And nowadays, the other way around. Uh, if you looked at the news, I will show something later. You can have neural networks produce pictures from verbal descriptions of scenes. Um, and in the context, this last one is important in the context of natural language processing. So sequence models are very important. Um, you can both score as well as generate text with these models. You can essentially generate new text from old text or from uh, new output from input. Uh, you can create music based on um, pre-trained sequences and you can even translate and, and uh, if you've seen Google Translate, I'm also going to show an example later there, it has become pretty good at that. And again, because we by now do not only have very small models, but pretty big neural network models. Um, 
So what we've done is we trained a network with roughly 15,000 line drawings from this building exercise. The results were extremely encouraging. We have very high agreement. Um, and IA gave us an additional research grant besides the Tims and Pearls grants to explore that further and essentially scale this up to new items or additional items. So we are working on that and hope for 23 that we might be able to score a few items like that. Um, similar project, but in a different item type. We also look at written responses. Um, so we have open-ended written responses, and we look right now only in three at three languages, but we are expanding that, of course, because we have many more languages. Um, right now, we are using a pretty simple approach that is called bag of words, and we are trying different machine learning and deep learning methods. We're looking again at scoring agreement of different approaches, including logistic regression, artificial neural networks, random forests, etc. But we are kind of uh, yeah, now focusing more on, on neural networks because they tend to be more successful in many instances. Uh, results are quite encouraging. In my older slides, I was saying something about 91%, but we also have more simple items where we get much higher agreement. This is somewhat tricky because you can imagine across languages, you get very different responses. If you ask a student, explain why so and so, not even this is not even about language or translation. It's also about what do you get in terms of a response if somebody hears explain why. Uh, so that's a little bit harder to train. But for short responses where students ask to essentially give a phrase or find a central piece of information, that is very well possible to do this kind of stuff. Um, so here are two papers, a shout out to my colleagues here from the Tims and Pearls International Study Center, Lillian, uh, Jenny, uh, Lale, also Mogul is uh, uh, working on yet another project around um, generating uh, uh, items. Uh, Dihau has been working in the summer on, on um, also scoring, um, automated scoring stuff. So we are essentially trying to address this from different angles and, and to look at different item types and to look into how we can improve uh, the procedures and to the very at the very least that we can uh, provide support in terms of looking at what level of agreement can we reach how high is that scoring reliability really because as you can imagine we can only get to 99 percent if the humans are also good at scoring if they are not uh, um, able to score reliably, um, we won't be able to do that uh, and, and train the uh, AI accordingly. Only in the case that we have <coughs> human scores, we can actually provide uh, something that also has high agreement with the human and uh, hopefully with an expert who would review those answers. Um, so it's, oops. Quite an exciting time. Um, I have to shift gear a little bit because I also want to talk to you about something that is a little bit more forward looking. So we are not there yet, but we are making great strides. Um, we do not only want to look into, well, we have an item that was produced by human experts, content experts, and that is um, then um, scored by either humans or computers we would also look uh, want to look into automated item generation and just because we need a lot of items and uh, even if we don't write items in the sense of uh, having the magic wand and telling a computer give me 50 math items that won't happen anytime soon we would still have machineries or technology that would produce us uh, produce something for us that is a draft item that could be used in human reviews and human uh, uh, expert discussion conversations to take these as as input as ideas as inspiration for new items um, and yeah let me just tell you what, what we are doing there um, i will start with not the ancient past, this actually goes much 
more further back. Uh, I only cite stuff here that is from the early 2000s, essentially. Um, automated item generation goes at least two decades back um, uh, beyond that, if not three decades. Um, people were trying very early on to produce items based on an algorithm, simple calculation items uh, on a computer, more or less on, on, on the fly, uh, without a human reviewing those items. These things are being done in the industry, so we will hear about that uh, from other speakers. But of course, you have to do it right because you want to have high quality items, so you can't just try it out and use it. So there has to be a lot of work and review and, and quality control there. What you can imagine is that it might be relatively simple in items like this. I don't know how many of you know these kinds of intelligence tests. So a language-free Raven type problem. Uh, you can imagine that you can generate variations of that easily and um, you have to find the right response among eight options. There are nine fields, one is empty, and the computer essentially generates by means of very uh, strict rules items that look different and that are difficult to figure out uh, to some extent. That can be done pretty well. There are tools for that, so this kind of algorithm rule-based generated automated item generation. There's somebody else joining. They don't fully monitor the waiting room here because I'm talking. <laughs> um, these uh, four packages, I actually left out my example here, sorry, I had to cut a slide. And you will see my GPT-3 examples later. Um, there are multiple packages that can be used for this rule-based automated item generation. But this is uh, essentially a, a tool for simple items, for the type of items that I just showed you, or something like this. Um, again, also simple math items. Um, if you want to go to a more complex item type or something that has different types of content, not intelligence type items uh, that are mainly quantitative, uh, if you want to go into other domains, uh, um, my previous job was in um, medical licensing. If you want to generate something for medical licensing exams or for personality tests or for um, other domains, you need other tools. And there again, we are sliding from the rule-based, maybe more traditional, either NLP or natural item, not, not quite natural, uh, aut uh, automated item generation in the more traditional sense. Uh, you have to go from rule-based feature engineering to more uh, um, feature extraction based on uh, yeah kind of black box learning it's still uh, pretty much supervised learning because you're telling the computer essentially what to do and what to associate with what so um, and one of the ways of doing that is to use language models the older type of language models, I just read up on that yesterday again, were pretty much all recurrent neural networks. Uh, recurrent neural networks have built-in feedback loops. I'm going to show a very simple example of that. And they essentially get an input and an output sequence uh, offset by one step in time so that they by means of these feedback loops and the association of input and output uh, sequence, they can learn um, complex associations between characters and subsequent characters or words and subsequent words uh, and so on. So in a very simple picture, if you just look at these indices, you would get an input, which is x0, x1, x2, xt, and you would get an output that is essentially shifted by one index. Um, and you would have somewhere in the middle a hidden layer that also has feedback loops so that each layer also moves their output to the next hidden layer input. Um, these types of 
th this produces something like a memory cell that actually understands, okay, before this output character, there was that output character, and maybe two output characters ago, there was that one. So these types of neural networks have a hidden state with a memory kind of uh, um, uh, complex associated with that. Um, these were used a lot for translation, for language models, for language generation. And they have a certain complexity and they are surprisingly powerful. They make text that kind of sounds like the original sequence, but very often they also make nonsense to say uh, it, it friendly. Sometimes it's really garbage and you can't use it. So you have to be careful what the output is and really closely monitor these models. So it's much more, yeah, it produces a lot of material, but you have to carefully filter that uh, output. Um, in my study that I contact, conducted a few years ago, uh, I used personality items. They seemed like a low hanging fruit. Uh, again, those are short sentences. They state something about a person, whether a person would agree or disagree to that. And um, they are kind of, yeah, an interesting case because they they sometimes sound a little, maybe I would say not quite weird, but they sound a little, they, they touch upon different types of topics that somebody might not fully agree with. So if a language model produces something that's a little bit variable, maybe it's actually an advantage. Um, my problem was I didn't have that many items to work with, but still, fortunately, there's a public domain database for these personality items that contains yeah, 3,300 roughly personality items. Um, they also have translations. I didn't care about translations at that point. Um, but that's a story for the end of this talk. Um, okay, so I went there, I bought some time on, um, no, back then I did this all on a machine at home. Uh, you don't really need the cloud for that. These models are still pretty small. Um, and we were, I was able to generate items that look pretty good. Of course, I had a lot of garbage and had to throw a lot of items away that were produced, but after just some surface level filtering out, um, I had a lot of items that I could use to augment a personality questionnaire. And then I went and tested that. It cost me like 80 bucks. Uh, and within two and a half hours, I had a couple of hundred respondents on Amazon Turk who filled out this personality questionnaire. These were 43 items. A little bit more than half of them were generated um, from five-factor personality inventories. And the interesting part was the factor structure coming out of that was actually not that bad. So it kind of looked like a five factor structure still, even with a small sample. Um, the factor loadings were very comparable. Um, the items seemed kind of, yeah, not too strange. And it was a nice little success um, to be able to actually produce something like that. So then I was thinking about how to move that forward and actually use another neural network to look into how close those items are to real items and then to filter them automatically. But I unfortunately never got there because time in uh, artificial intelligence research really flies. I got this published, which was nice. But since then, uh, the field has made so incredibly great strides that these new recurrent neural networks are far behind us. Nobody's using them anymore, even for translation or for language generation, because now we have transformers. Transformers are incredibly big. Um, let me see my time, it's still going well. Incredibly big uh, artificial neural networks. Instead of having this recurrent recurrency structure and this memory structure, they have positional encoding with, I think, sine waves they use with a more or less standard kind of transformation of the position to a uh, time variable encoding 
that each word also gets encoded where it was and how close it is to other words in a finite sequence. Um, there are attention units. I can't really explain every piece of this here. And um, there are ways essentially to keep topics active in this network that are then essentially used to to, to, to guide either the transition uh, translation process or the transition to new language generation. Um, these really took off. Um, OpenAI produced a couple of them. Oops, I'm jumping too fast here. OpenAI produced a couple of them. Um, GPT-2 was uh, a network I used. Uh, there is now GPT-3. There are other networks. I will show a little graph of that. And um, these networks can be retrained. Um, the study I want to talk about just a little bit before I get into the latest generation is uh, using OpenAI's GPT-2 transformer model. And I'm going to show an example of what they're capable of doing in a later slide. I retrained this model, which was trained essentially on a, I think they actually, it's a technical term, they call it the pile. It's a huge text corpus based on the internet, mainly Wikipedia and other uh, openly accessible internet texts. So you have a very large text corpus that represents all the complexity of language as it's represented on the web. And I use that and train this uh, GPT different versions of the GPT transformer model so that this model essentially represents our language and all its complexity. And then what you can do after the fact, after it was trained, and the training is way too expensive and has to be done on big machines, you can take it, and this one I could still download on my computer on a big workstation, and I retrained it with uh, PubMed, um, essentially all the publicly available medical articles that I could find. There are like hundreds of journals that have publicly available articles. I transferred them to JSON format, um, made it into a training database and retrained this uh, GPT-2 transformer model. And then I started happily generating medical uh, uh, certification items. Again, they were not perfect, but they sounded a lot like real items, and they were not just one sentence. This was a little paragraph, so I will show you a little example later on. But as you see, this was 2019, so it's already quite a bit since then. So this is really the change I want to talk about. So we tend to plan ahead multiple years, but what's happening in the field is that, um, yeah, you see here, slightly after early in 2019 gpt2 came out i took the publicly available version immediately when it came out because i was already working on this topic and so it is a great opportunity to um yeah do another study um but again this was a, yeah, again overwritten more or less by gpt3 which completely took over the, the uh, discussion in the field. This is probably the most used model, not only in research, but also in, in a lot of apps and applications and startups where people are trying to monetize this. This is being used for code completion, for um, writing stories, for um, text adventures. There's AI Dungeon, if somebody, one, some of you are gamers or text-based gamers. Uh, there are essentially a lot of applications out there that try to uh, commercialize these applications, but there is also a lot of research going on. These models now have been used for discovering new proteins. So they're used in biomedical research essentially to gen yeah, generate me a thousand proteins and I will check how they what they fold, how, how they fold like and, and what they might be used for. So these models are, are very much in, in the focus of, uh, of research in many different areas. Um, so where are we now? My 
latest exploration together with um, researchers um, at the study center. So uh, we are looking into what can we do with these big models. Uh, Umugul is uh, working, Umugul Bizaran is working on a project with me. We're not there yet. We haven't published anything yet, but I'm going to show you a few other examples where I'm just exploring um, uh, and, and trying to essentially really see which direction we can go with that. Um, of course, you could argue this is all the completely wrong direction. Item writing, you could also say it's an art form, but then again, computers were thought of not being able to produce art. Uh, but wait a minute, no, I think you can download a new Elvis song uh, made by an MIT tool. Um, there's another tool by Google and OpenAI. DALL-E right now is producing artwork and people are flooding the art uh, world with that. Some art platforms now don't allow um, artificially created artwork anymore because it's really flooding the market, it seems. So it seems like what we thought AIs can or cannot do has to be revised once in a while at least. There's a little shout out to one of my heroes, Konrad Suse, who was a computer engineer who pretty much programmed the first fully Turing complete computer and became an artist later on in life when his computer were kind of outdated. On the left, you see a Konrad Suse original, or of course, just a digital image of that. On the right, what I told Dali to produce in the style of Konrad Suse, not quite identical, but it hasn't been trained on that identical uh, style, obviously. But if you look in the literature or if you look on the online, uh, this Dali produces quite interesting work. I will show you a few more examples like that. Uh, Items are, of course, more than just nice illustrations or artwork. How, how can we know that computers know and what, what and how to write it? Um, this GPT-3 now has a variety uh, or was, was trained further, I should say. And there's now instruct GPT that can be told what to write and in what style, for example. Grover is another huge language model that can produce fake news and can detect fake news, can actually see how close real news articles uh, are to other real news articles or what looks more like a fake news. So if we are not there yet, I believe we are almost there. This is a, an example that's also already a year old. Uh, I made that for another talk. So I gave a little prompt uh, for a story. Lily was a five-year-old, very inquisitive spider. She wanted to know how things work, blah, blah, blah. How do plants grow, etc., etc. So I gave this computer a little prompt and then asked to continue the story. The computer's response was making halfway sense. Her mother helped her gather some things, but she was not sure whether she had everything she needed. She went outside her house. She ran through the fields, she jumped from one plant to the other, she walked on the stream. This is a small model that you can download, that you can run in your browser. Uh, this was 2021, a small 6 billion model. Now GPT-3 is um, 175 billion parameters. So those models are much more powerful. Um, when you try it, so you write as a prompt, write a two-digit multiplication multiple choice item with four response options, of which one option is correct. Then GPT-3 does this. Not very impressive, but actually it is. Even that simple item is pretty impressive. There's one correct response, so it followed the instructions and made that item without any further uh, um, uh, intervention from my side. So I gave it what it should do, and it produces an item. I tried chemistry. Well, write a multiple choice item about oxidation for an eighth grade chemistry test. It can write items like that. I don't know whether it's a perfect item, but I've seen items like that. I looked at public domain science uh, item collection. It doesn't look that different. Uh, there are, again, also on um, 
NLP and AI sites like Kaggle, there are competitions like that to score items. It's actually one of the bigger uh, sections in Kaggle. Um, Kaggle is an online uh, um, competition website for AI competitions. And you can essentially log in there and, and contribute and, and try to send a solution in and you can win prizes, of course. It's a very sneaky way of, of um, uh, crowdsourcing of very talented people, I would say. There are now Kaggle grandmasters who have a high rank in how many competitions they were actually winning. I close my door here. Um, let's try another example. Oh yeah, if you don't like multiple choice items, I told GPT-3, okay, maybe multiple choice, that's easy. Do a close item, it produces a close item. And then, uh, I'm almost out of time, but I'm almost done here. Um, Write a paragraph on rainforests followed by a multiple choice item on the topic with four response options. It writes a little paragraph. Uh, the paragraph makes sense. I don't think it contains a lot of factual errors. Maybe the percentages have to be checked and adjusted and uh, how many million acres that sometimes made up because this thing, after all, it's still a neural network. It doesn't really know anything. It doesn't have conceptual knowledge. So those things have to be checked. The question, however, and the options make sense. Again, I would never give it immediately to test takers. There would always be human review, always, as it's also with human submitted items. When we receive items, we also do a very careful revision uh, check modification another revision checking with countries checking with content experts you would still do that but you could have item drafts produced like that okay and then you can say dali please present me with another piece of artwork that kind of fits this thing give me something about yeah if rainforest and then some renewable energy so i forgot what i asked you but you can also get the illustration almost automatically to that item then you can use google translate i don't know how many of you speak german it's a pretty good translation i can tell you and then maybe jenny can tell you how good the translation into korean is again you can't use that without any checks you have to check everything carefully also including translations including whether the illustration is appropriate or not but it's possible and it can give you item drafts that can be checked instead of having people brooding over oh i need a i i need an item about viruses i need an item about the water cycle this thing can produce something in less than five seconds that at least gives you a starting point and in some cases it's actually already pretty good as in these multiple choice items for simple multiplications for uh, i don't know fourth graders or earlier even um, so that's more or less my summary. <laughs> and so we are more or less at the verge of having really high power technology at our fingertips to use this kind of stuff. And I believe we can use it at least for automated scoring. And I believe that uh, automated item generation is really just a step away that this would be feasible. Um, I should stop sharing and then maybe we can have some questions. Thank you very much, Matthias. One thing you, you kind of elided over is the uh, issue of automated test assembly, which is another potential use of... Oh yeah, very good. Yeah, we just did that. <laughs> Again, I have a shout out to Umogul uh, and, and she had really good success. We tried out a few different things. Again, there are both R packages and commercial packages out there. And again, it was a very successful combination then with our development team. So um, the um, mathematics and science experts looked at that very closely. And also we had the expert groups and reviewing everything um, very, very closely to, to see um, whether all the content constraints are fulfilled and 
but of course they had to do a lot of fine tuning because you can't put in all the constraints you have to be careful with some constraints where you just have very few items right okay thank you very much um so we have a few minutes so uh, would anyone like to jump in with a question or a comment a question <laughs> hi matthias hi. Um, so good to listen to your talk so for gpt3 models and transformers right now uh, students who are trained in artificial intelligence and uh, deep learning are still using the uh, models even uh, you know, transformers are all considered at, at the most advanced level. And how fast do you think the field will evolve later after transformers and GPT-3 models and uh, new things will come up? That's one thing. And because all for students there, it takes time to learn all of this, to be trained, to pick up this knowledge. And for new students who are interested in this field, um, what do they need to learn and how do they prepare for artificial intelligence field? Mm -hmm. um, so the tools themselves get easier and easier to use. I think that is not the problem. And they also change over time, of course. It will, in, in two or three years, it won't be GPT or anything. It will be something else. Um, so we can tell them, you learn that model, and then you're prepared for the future. What they need to learn is this kind of, yeah, critically, taking apart what can go wrong. I think that's really my, my, my greatest lesson of life that I, I really took away from all the stuff that I've done is we, we, we have to test the boundaries. So when does it break down? Does it produce something that we shouldn't be using? That something that actually produces something that introduces uh, things we don't want in the materials, in the scoring, in the new item materials, um, we have to make sure also to communicate very clearly about how it was done and how to uh, um, use these new technological tools. And I think the kind of quality control, how we can actually assess that it's doing what it should without any adverse side effects. So I think you need those technical skills, but then also a lot of yeah, critical thinking skills in terms of uh, methodological knowledge in order to have your toolkit to check whether what you're doing is actually getting you where you want to be. Yeah, I agree The transformers, especially including the NGT3 models behind it, you, as you mentioned that they become easier to use. You program it and then the results will come up. But what is behind the algorithm and uh, there are a lot of uh, black boxes in between. Yeah. So Thank you. good for our students to get more training in that area. Good question. Thank you, Mandy. Other comments or questions? Well, uh, let me jump in. So Matthias, I guess my question is, can you foresee developing uh, AI systems that monitor other AI systems? In other words, where you where you have some sort of system that is monitoring, for example, automated scoring, and is tracking and and can provide a a warning that the uh, system is going is off base, sort of like a meta meta analysis <laughs> of of the scoring. I either that or you could even use our good old tools that we learned as our bread and butter tools. So I think we can still monitor it with the same. Uh, tools that we have of uh, um, both agreement as well as, uh, um, I don't know, bias, etc. There's um, you know, just some shameless uh, advertisement here. Uh, we have a book coming up on NLP and assessment, and there's a chapter, not by our group, but somebody from ETS. Uh, on how to monitor these AI-based scores. So there are there is a chapter about fairness in AI-based scores. And mm -hmm. so the field is moving there. So we are very careful. Again, it will be a mix of human review, statistical tools, and maybe as you say, AI tools monitoring a other AI tools. So you have these adversarial networks, for example, that can detect whether 
the production is not quite up to uh, snuff or is not quite at the standard uh, that you want it to be. So they're very sophisticated techniques and that would be also a very needed part of the training to say, well, how do you build in all these steps of uh, uh, caution and, and making sure that what you get out of these black boxes really adheres to the quality standards. Right, right. Okay, thank you. Well, we have time for one more question or comment. Let me invite uh, somebody to uh, contribute. No, we don't have any takers. <laughs> All right, well, uh, Matthias has to make a hard stop at one o'clock, so we're gonna give him an extra two minutes to uh, recoup. So thank you, Matthias, for a very interesting uh, talk, and I'm sure it's going to spark a lot of conversation. And as you indicated right at the outset, there will be two more uh, brown bags in this area coming up. And we invite everybody to join us and to invite uh, some of your friends and family to uh, participate as well. So thanks very much. And uh, to everyone, a, a good afternoon. Enjoy the good weather. Yeah. Thank you again, thank Matthias. You. Thank you. Bye-bye.